When I first came up with the If It Were My Dream form to talk about dreams, to put everyone on the same intellectual and emotional level, regardless of whether they had letters after their names or whatever, it was an original notion in my mind consciously. It turns out that Montague Ullman had already published mm -hmm. about using that technique. I hadn't read him at the time. And as soon as I did read him, I wrote him and said, you know, this is wonderful. I was not familiar with your work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, see, my guess is that it's been around a good deal longer than that because the simple truth of the matter is so hard to avoid. Whenever anybody tells me a dream, I have no choice except to imagine my own version of it. That's right. Even if I'm a skilled telepath and I'm picking up the dreamer's <laughs> right. experience of the dream directly without words, it's still me that's picking them up. Right. It's still my experience and my biases. It's still coming through my filter, which, yep. is, which is, belongs to me. <laughs> that's right, which makes it my imagined version of the dream. And I suspect people have known that since always. Right. Right. It's been unfashionable to articulate it, but I think the time has come to say it bluntly and say this is how it is. Uh, I have to confess to a certain amount of irritation that this way of work that Billy and I are so deeply engaged in has to get called projective dream work right. as though there were all these other techniques around that didn't involve projection. Exactly. And, bam, exactly. Thank you for playing. No. <laughs> That's not it's how so it true. works. It's so true. There's no way I can escape having my own projections right. onto the dream. Because Where, it's unconscious. Right. So, and this is another thing that I find fascinating about group work, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is that, um, you know, I can hear a dream narrative, and I can see a lot of people taking notes, and I can see a lot of us focus on one element of the dream. And then suddenly there'll be one person who maybe hasn't said anything, the whole workshop, right. and they'll notice once very subtle nuance of the dream that might have just completely yeah. passed me by. That the, that the pin had a beautiful red ribbon attached mm -hmm. to it. And and this dreamer will say, well, you know, that, that red ribbon reminds me of my grandfather. And and, and, I, and we're like, red ribbon? And all the, everyone sort of looks at each other and says, where did the, did the red ribbon show up? And it's interesting that the dreamer will go back and say, oh, wait, yeah, there was a red ribbon. And they'll read that part of the dream again. And I find that particularly fascinating. Yeah. That so that there, that's the one jewel piece of, of the dream work that comes out that that there was something that someone with a heightened sense of awareness, because they had been listening more yeah. often than talking throughout the weekend, that they pick up on it and something that we all could have missed. So that's another reason why this we, time around we would have missed it. If right. That right. And and it often is that the the dreamer that hasn't said very much during. Mm -hmm during the, the, the workshop. And that's another thing about what both Jeremy and I have experienced is we'll get an email or a letter from, from a dreamer and say, you know, I know you may not remember me because I didn't say one word and I listened intently to it, but I have to tell you, this was a profound experience for me. It changed my life. And this is another thing that we try to tell people. You know, you can come to the, to the weekends you don't have, you're not required to share unless you feel the urge to. You don't, you're not required to put your name in the bowl for an opportunity to have your dream work if you don't, if it doesn't feel comfortable. We often say, you know, you're, it, you can just look and participate and be part of the experience. Indeed. So we just now are, are at our tw the 21st retreat. Uh, we've, we've done two a year since since 2003 um so now we're into the the going up into the <laughs> the, the next uh, round of it you know because we're starting out with with uh, 21. so we so we've done two a year for since you have two since 2003 so for 10 years we've worked side by side we've done other individual more special workshops yep. too so I think we've worked together 25 times or oh, 26 times. Oh, at least. Times, I would say it's more like, like 26, 27. And, it, and we also, when Jeremy comes into town, I often come to his other workshops too because we like to 
to share dream work yeah. together. It's fun. And we like to play off each other when we're doing the work. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people continue to come back because this has become a community. It's a, I like to think of it as a virtual community, not virtual in the sense of like on the computer virtual, virtual in the sense that it, that it um, coalesces and then dissipates and coalesces again. Um, so it's, it's a, a, we, we are united even when we're not in the group circle together. We all rely on each other for advice and, and, and uh, support. Uh, we can go many months without talking to one another, but at the minute we get back in the room together, it's like, like sisters and brothers and coming together and sharing again, oh, it's so wonderful to see you again. So I think a lot of people return to the retreats because there is a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. And a sense of renewal. Renewal, very good. And it, and it feels like, I think, I think one of the pieces that we do on Sunday morning, which I particularly love, is we go around the circle and anyone who has a book that they're, that they're writing or that they have written, if they're thinking about writing, or they have a workshop that they're that they're um, you know want to want to promote, or they have a new website, or they just just have a new idea that they wish to share with the group, we give everyone an opportunity to to share whatever feels right for, in the moment, and then we continue to to support each other through by sharing on each other's websites and and email blasts or or just by word of mouth. By the way, you know, did you know Laura Deal's books out? You know that, that kind of thing, and we and we. We continue to support each other's work. We don't. We don't try to compete with each other. Really, it's not a competition. Really? It's not like, oh, I want to get people for my workshop, so I don't want you to, you, you know, your workshop competes with mine. No, no. It's more like, let's all. We all have different ways of doing dream work, and so we're all supportive of each other. And there are a couple of people who have developed unique ways of working with dream. It began here mm -hmm. and they've developed their own ways of doing it and are now stars on their own, out doing their own work. That's right. That's it's right. wonderful. What pops to mind for me with internal world and external world is I have to think about literalism, which is a piece that we often talk about in the groups. Mistaken literalism in, in particular, um, all, our society is very literal. Everyone wants to think of everything in rational terms and wants everything to fit in a concise paragraph and make sense. And it doesn't work that way because we're all so such individual, individual people. And I think that one of the big reasons why group projective dream work helps, so, helps us so much is because opening our mind to the understanding of the language of metaphor helps us to expand our imagination and to, to expand our sense of compassion. Because I need to be able to experience it along with others to realize I can have a completely different viewpoint on what this might mean, a metaphor, and the pers other person's seemingly opposite co projection. And they're both and true. And they're both true. So this is why we say yes and instead of either or. It's not an either or process. It's not a let's let's not, let's not accept that and let's accept this. It's we embrace everything to say because everything's made of light and dark. It leads to an increasing awareness of paradox. Mm -hmm. Once it becomes clear that these dreams have multiple layers of meaning, right. and it becomes clear because it's spoken, and the dreamer verifies, yes, I have an insight that mm -hmm. it's an aha for me. And here's this other thing that sounds oh, contradictory. And yet I have an aha of insight about that too. It becomes clearer and clearer that we human beings carry these kinds of contradictory thoughts and feelings around in us all the time. Right. And that we live in this paradoxical world where things are not totally good and not totally bad. The more aware we become of that complexity, the more responsibly we can negotiate the world that we live in. And the more we can embrace the parts of ourself that we, yes. that we, that we think we are supposed to be rejecting. Yep. And actually, if we embrace them, they stop becoming shadow qualities yep. and they start be, we start to re-energize them into what they are meant to be. Yep. 
we shine light on the shadow pieces and, and we say, oh, that's what this energy is all about. It's, it's not a negative anymore. It's something that I can use. It's a developmental piece, a work mm -hmm. in progress. Mm -hmm. Now, probably one of the most difficult things for people to get at a deep level is that those seemingly negative energies that Carl Jung calls the shadow, rightly so, I think that's, I think that's one of those names that he got right. <laughs> Lovely, gender-free name. Everybody's got a shadow. That's right. The shadow, in its specific appearance, always hides from view because it seems so utterly irredeemable. Mm -hmm. It's a failure of imagination. I can't imagine anything good mm -hmm. being associated with this figure. When the deeper truth of the matter is that every shadow figure hides from view initially the very thing I need. That's it. The very energy, the very opinion, the very ability to act that is preventing me from growing and changing and becoming my more healthy old self. Mm -hmm. Dream work is bar none, in my experience, the most valuable way to find those hidden gifts of the shadow. Right. And you, we've both been at it long enough to know that totally ridiculous as it may sound, it really is true. That really is the way it is. This is how the shadow works. And to realize that, that by, bring, by embracing the shadow qualities and bringing them into the light, I, I regain all the energy because it took so much energy to press it down and repress it. And I, I like to use the metaphor of a jack-in-the-box. And it's like, you know, I used to do this as, as a kid, as a game. And, and help, you know, crank the, crank the, the side of the jack-in-the-box, jack but hold the lid down. And so each time the jack-in-the-box wants to pop up, I'm holding it down. And I'm cranking, I'm cranking. So basically when I think of that metaphor, if that's what's happening in my psyche, I'm pushing down my shadow qualities, then I, I can't, there's not much else I can do because both hands are being yeah. occupied. I'm holding down the jack yeah, I can't give and up I'm and go crank, do something else. No, I'm just cranking away. I'm cranking away, cranking away. And then <laughs> cranking away, cranking away. And that's and that, I think often what happens with the shadow is it does pop up at the most inopportune times. Yeah. And the young uh, comment of what I resist persists. Yeah. So I and I'm and that which I what and what does I encounter it as fate. Yeah. Anything that remains unconscious in my psyche I will encounter outside myself as, as if by fate. As if by and I'll call it fate. Yeah. But it's my shadow it's coming my to shadow. announce itself. Yeah. That's what happens. Feeding off the energy I'm using to hold it down until it's strong enough to break my grip. Mm-hmm which often happens when I'm most tired and most distressed and most unable to continue to hold it down. Yeah. Bam! They're all okay. coming. The people that have resisted coming to the retreats have often, or to group projective dream work experiences, have often said to me things like, I know, I know, what, my, I know what my dreams mean. That's, that's one, of the, one of the first things. Another thing is, I never remember my dreams. Or, or worse yet, they'll say, I never dream. Or, I already, I, I work with this guru, Shamala Mamba, and he tells me what my dream means yeah. all the time. Yeah. Or I have this book. <laughs> yeah. I have this book that I use, and I, it's always guided me since I was 12 years old, and I continue to use this book. Cats mean this, and... and, and Tornadoes mean this. So um, to address all those, it's like first of all, you know, if I'm someone who who says I never dream, the truth of the matter is, is we all dream, and we all dream every single night. And in fact, all creatures yeah, dream. That's right. And if I say that, it's the phrase is I habitually forget my dream experience every night because I'm not I'm not taking the effort to remember, or I haven't been encouraged to remember. And there hasn't been a, 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 society, a community that has, a, has embraced my ability uh, or my desire to, to remember my dreams. And as a matter of fact, most people have been actively discouraged That's right. from That's remembering right. their dreams. So I, and I often tell people one of the best remedies is, is, is if I'm someone who doesn't remember my dreams is to come to the group. 
because then I have the advantage of imagining other people's dreams, so I, I get the experience of that. And also, quite often, it happens that those dreamers go home and start to remember their dreams more frequently. Yeah. Or that a dream memory will pop into their minds right while a group is going on. That's right. That's right. That happens a lot. Yep. So then the other, other things that I mentioned is like, you know, okay, I, I, we talked about this before. I cannot know what my dreams mean. There's no way. I can get to a, maybe the first layer of it. Mm -hmm. But what I will tend to do is tell myself things that I already know. And I'll say, oh, that's that dream again about you know, that my, my, my mother. <laughs> my mother. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why do I need my dream to come and tell me that again? You know, why do, why do I need my dream to come and tell me something that I already know? So I need to have fresh look at it from another perspective from other people. The other thing about books, you know, books can be very helpful with dreams. However, if I limit myself to one particular book or one particular definition for a symbol, then I'm really robbing myself of a, of a rich, rewarding experience of seeing all the, the nuances of it, the expansiveness of it. It cannot be limited to one sentence in a book. Every single person is going to have a different relationship to a cat. Some people love cats. Some people don't like cats. Some people have been permanently injured by cats. So there, so everyone's going to have a different relationship to cat. <laughs> so and it there be. will be basic metaphors that we all share. Right. Probably one of the most obvious ones, it's so obvious that people even forget that it's symbolic, is the universal human tendency to associate the direction up mm -hmm. with light and consciousness and goodness mm -hmm. and the direction down with darkness and unconsciousness and at least anxiety, mm -hmm. often eliding all the way over into full-blown satanic evil. Mm -hmm. And apparently we come into the world predisposed to make these symbolic associations and we tend to literalize those associations until we learn better. I've always been interested in dreams since I was a kid. And one of the first gifts that DreamWork gave me was before I was seven years old. I came to my extremely gracious and kind and wise grandmother one day with a dream. And I told her the dream and I asked her what it meant. And she laughed and she said, oh, honey, it's a dream. It doesn't mean anything. And I was so shocked because I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it meant something. And so at this, you know, before the age of reason, I had this epiphany, oh, dear me. I don't think I was old enough to have full profanity at my disposal. <laughs> if she got that wrong, yeah. what else has she gotten wrong? And it was at that moment that I first began to take a kind of radical responsibility for my own life. Mm -hmm. Early for that, but I have, I have no regrets about coming to it that early. Yeah. And it was dreams and talking about dreams that helped that to happen. It also demonstrated, group projective dream work demonstrated itself to be the most effective consciousness raising technique for overcoming racism that I have yet discovered. Short of putting people in life-threatening situations where they must cooperate with each other, mm -hmm. dream work, particularly projective dream work, consciously projective dream work, since it really is all projective, anyway, whether it's acknowledged or not, is the best way to help people recognize the deep shared common humanity that binds them together over and above all the ways we use to separate ourselves from one another. Certainly not the only way to do that, but it, it's the most gentle, most kind, and most effective way that I know of. I have been testing that initial experience <laughs> literally on a, day, on a daily basis 
for coming up on 50 years now. And I have not had any experiences that have led me to view dreams any other way than that. All dreams come in the service of health and wholeness and speak a universal language. And that wholeness is not limited to the wholeness of the individual psyche or the individual personality. It is also manifested in the collective. And that is immensely interesting and valuable and satisfactory for me. I am one of the original four founders of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, which I am now fairly confident will survive after my death. I was not initially confident about that, but I now am. It's going to go on. It's going to go rolling on after I'm gone. And it is a legacy I am very pleased to have had a hand in leaving. Um, I'm hoping that the egalitarian way that Billy and I do dream work will have a lasting effect on the hierarchical way that almost everybody else does dream work. Because at one level, it's a free speech issue. We've been talking to each other about our dreams since we've been human. Mm -hmm. And to suddenly create a situation where we are forbidden to talk to each other about our dreams is a disastrous social and cultural mistake. And it's a direction we're moving in, and there are people like Billy and I who are attempting to stem that tide, and I think doing a pretty good job. I also know that you can do a lot of good in the world if you don't get attached to who gets the credit. <laughs> so I am very interested in having these things happen whether future analysts append my name to any of that. And I have worked very hard to not have this way of work get called Taylor-style dream work. Mm -hmm. This is group projective dream work. Monty Ullman did it first. And there's now a movement to call it Taylor Ullman dream work. I, I, I told you at the, at yeah, the IASD, I, know. I went to, to the... Um, the, the workshop, the first workshop I went to was, <laughs> if this were my if this were my game, well it isn't. <laughs> and then it was all about how the almond method was running the risk of being lost yeah. from, from the face of the earth because yeah. it's actually a very rigid method. In yes, it is. it is. It's very rigid because there's only a short brief time that you can ask questions right. of the dreamer. And the dreamer actually has to turn their back <laughs> To the other, to the others who may yes. guide break the <laughs> circle. It's it, it. It was surprising to me. I've and I have actually been in groups where I've had. To, I was the dreamer, and I had to turn my yeah. back while people made their projections, and it didn't feel comfortable no. to me at all. So, the way we work is, as Jeremy says, it's very egalitarian, and it's and it has to do with empowerment, yeah. not not about you know where we want to be on in the spotlight and we yeah. want everyone to go home and quote us and and it's not that we we're interested in in a group experience of consciousness being evolved and it's vital enough and interesting enough for people to carry it on by themselves whether they That's remember right. they got it from us or not yeah. getting gifts from from the work oh my goodness yeah i mean it this is i i mean Quite honestly, I don't make money doing this. I, I, I mean, if it was a money-making proposition, I would, should, I, should. I would have stopped. Well, I mean, the particular big group things can yeah. can sometimes go run over budget, um, but I don't do it for that reason. It's not a money-making proposition for me. It, it's, it's my soul's work, and I, and I'm, I'm drawn to it as a calling. And it's, it's something. It took me many years to even be able to say that out loud. Yeah. But it's true. It, it, it's something I remember working many years ago on dreams, dreams about dream work with, with Jeremy, and, and he said, well, if this were my dream building, <laughs> I would have to start talking about dream work as my spiritual practice. Yeah. And that took me so long to say that aloud, to be actually uh, say that out, this is my spiritual practice. This is a spiritual practice that we're in, in, embarking on right now. And I think part of that is because of the, the stigma that goes along with with 
labeling it something spiritual practice I, there's so much so many pra spiritual practices that come along with so much dogma people have been so injured and one of the famous phrases that one of the dreamers came up with she says I've noticed that this work tends to attract the spiritually disenfranchised so often people that have been injured I have to use the word injured that's what comes to mind by their by the religion that they were brought up with for whatever reason it might be but however they still have a desire for a connection with the divine and this has been a big wounding for so many people because how do I connect with the divine why do I have to go through all of this shame and pain shame and pain and and, and uh, I, I want I don't want to oh, use the word ritual wrong because I actually like I like ritual but there's overuse of of methods that have to be followed and and rigid uh, rules that people are, are, are so often their, their desire for that connection to the divine is squelched it, it's 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 suffocated and this work helps to bring that out again and say yeah actually in my dream I had a sense of, of the di connecting with the divine and to be able to talk about that freely and, and openly in a group and not be criticized or shamed mm -hmm. and to be accepted and embraced because we're all we all have a spark of the divine inside right. of us each time we say namaste I'm saying the God in me salutes the God in you the, my divine spark says hello to your divine spark we're both focusing on the large benefits that's right and the personal benefits are astounding mm -hmm. uh, greater conscious understanding of confusing emotions, uh, right. dispelling of fear, upwellings of tremendous creative energies, uh, right. evolution of the ability to love and be loved consciously. Mm -hmm. Those are all direct benefits that I've experienced and I've certainly projected that Billy has experienced them as well. To embrace my authentic life, I think yeah. that's that's a big piece. Is, I, you know, I I've added on to Jeremy's uh, all dream, dreams come in the service of health and wholeness, always guiding us towards becoming our most authentic yeah. self, always. And always. that's a place where I can use always because I truly believe that the, that the dreams are are an organizing principle of the universe, and they want us to get to evolve and become greater beings. Yeah. And if it were physical, it wouldn't be that hard to understand. You could say, and no one would disagree with you, every breath you take is in the service of continuing life. Mm -hmm. Every heartbeat you experience is in the service of health and wholeness. And we take it for granted about physical activities. And it is just as true of the mental and emotional and psychic and intellectual and ultimately spiritual activities that constellate up around dream work. The, the personal benefits are immense. If it were just a way to lead a better life personally, I would still do it because I want to lead a better life. But my professional devotion to it is because it has these impacts on larger issues than whether or not I am happy and comfortable at any given moment, even though it addresses those questions regularly. Right. And that's where one of, one of the dreamers I used to work with a lot, she said, you know, Billy, it's so globally personal. And it really is. It's so globally personal. And, and it, it's about my individuation, but it's about the individuation of the collective. Mm -hmm. And I really believe each time that we do the group work, and we are in some ways healing parts of, oh, of the collective. Yes. It's like the fabric of the universe. There, there's, there's frays and, 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 and uh, tears. And, and each time we do want this group work, we're helping to mend and 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 patch up some yeah. of those frames. and strengthen. I mean, it's not so much a question of patching; is that the weaving itself gets strengthened.
People ask me a lot why I do this, why I sacrifice so much time, so much money, so much energy about putting together groups, and why is it? I think that the society, our society, is becoming more and more rationally minded and literally minded to the point where metaphor is disappearing in so many areas of our life. Metaphor is the language of the heart, it's the language of the soul. It's, what it, what, it's the way our dreams speak to us, it's the way our, our, uh, we see it in poetry, we see it in sacred narrative. We have to be able to, to instill this sense of metaphor, the love of metaphor in everyone because if we don't keep this language of metaphor alive, we lose our imagination. And if I lose my imagination, then I lose my compassion because I'm not able to, if I can't imagine myself being someone else, then I can't have a compassion for them. So that's really the essence of the work, is to be able to imagine myself in someone else's shoes, imagine myself truly being someone else, then I can truly have compassion for them.